Hey guys, welcome back to Sex Savvy Code, our Python 1 series. We are going to talk about for and why loops. And I kept the presentation short so that we can just jump into coding and then I will put more comments in the code itself. So here are today's goals. What are for loops? What are while loops? How do they look in Python? And common mistakes. Our first concept is a for loop. And a for loop is a loop that runs a set number of times. And if I was thinking of a real world example of a for loop, when you are getting directions from Google or from whatever application you're using, it will tell you how many times you need to turn. And if it tells you to turn two times, you only turn two times. Versus if it tells you to turn four times, it will only turn four times or you will only turn four times. So a for loop is completely numeric and it will only run that many number of times. A while loop on the other hand is a loop that continues to run as long as the condition is true. So this loop is normally used when you have no clue when how many times the program needs to run, but you do know when it needs to stop or continue on to another uh, set of your code. So for example, in real life, if you're working as a postal person and you're delivering mail, you continue to deliver mail until you have no mail left in your carrier or the time has hit eight o'clock or at the end of your shift. So you don't know how many doors you're going to stop at. It all just depends on how much mail is in the carrier bag. And it also depends on what time you get off of work for the day. So that condition or those conditions would normally use a while loop versus a for loop when you have no clue of how many times it needs to run, but you do know when it needs to stop. So it's time to practice. I am going to go to Repolit. This is what we use to code. If you haven't signed in already, go ahead and sign in. I am going to start coding. And this is Python. I will call this for loop example and create the REPL. Okay, so I'm going to make my screen just a little bit bigger for those of you who need to see more space. So there are a couple of things that you need to know about for loops. Um, they are loops that allow you to have number uh, a maximum of three types of input. We'll go through all of the types of inputs and we'll also understand how a for loop works in Python. So first off, let's just do a simple for loop. We start off with the word for, and we create a variable. And most cases you'll see one letter, like I, J, L, K, the entire alphabet, whatever <laughs> uh, comes to mind. Then you say the word in, you say range, and then you give it the number of times that you want to run. So if you want it to run four, four or five times, you put that number in, you put a colon, and then if you notice when I pressed enter, it went to a new line and it also tabbed inward. And I'm just going to print a statement that says, this is in a for loop. And press run. So if you notice, when I press run, I have one, two, three, four, five runs. And this is how you create a simple for loop. I'll write a comment about this. Five times. And prints and then five times. All right, 
so I am going to uh, do another for loop. But this time I want to investigate what is going on with the variable that we're using in our for loop. What's the point of using this variable um, if you don't see it actually working in action? So the way that the variable works is you can think of the variable as um, a position in the for loop. It has a job and its job in the for loop is to keep track of what current number we're on so that the for loop can know when to stop. So even without looking behind the scenes at what's going on with um, this variable i, if you were thinking about human language and human thought process, if you had someone that was that their job was to keep track of how many times something was running, they would have a counter. So imagine this person was had a counter and um, they starting from one, they were counting every person that passes by until it hits five people. So it'll it'll count one, two, three, four, five, and then once it realizes it's at five, it'll stop counting. So it's the same idea with this variable. Um, we don't have to create, we don't have to initialize the variable. We don't have to say that it starts at zero. We um, automatically, by using the structure of a for loop, will have a variable that will start that that will automatically have a starting point. And in the first for loop that we did, the starting point is actually going to be zero. Um, so let's take a look at that. I'm going to do another for loop and I'll just change the variable just so that you know that you can change the variable. It doesn't have to be the same. But I'm going to take the same um, loop number and put it as five again. But instead of printing a word, I want to print out the variable so that you can see what's going on with the variable. I'm also going to write a print statement above it and add a backslash n to make some spaces uh, or create some space between the first for loop. And I am going to label this so you know um, what type of for loop I'm doing. So looking at the variable in the for loop. So oops, speaking, <laughs> looking. So as I look at the variable in the for loop, if you notice, it always starts at zero. Um, this is just something that is common in many languages. Your starting point is always zero and not one. Uh, and when we learn about list in a few series or the next series, actually, um, you will learn that the location of, of any starting point is always zero. So you just want to keep that in mind when you're learning how to code is that we start at zero, not at one. But if you count from zero, it still adds up to five runs, but the value of the variable is actually from zero to four. All right. So that's something to just think about and, and know. Um, and why is this useful? It's useful because you can actually, because this variable is a way to keep track of location or, or numbers, I could use this variable um, in a calculation or, or to, to find something else. So this variable is usable, even though it's keeping track of the loop. I can also use that as like a, a reference point for something else. So for example, I'll try, let's do another one. I'm going to write um, using the variable in the loop. Um, to add. Let's do something like that. So I'm going to create another for loop 
y one more inch and let's say I'll do 10. Now my print statement, what I want to do is I want to print y plus 100. Okay, let's see what happens. So if you notice, using the variable y and adding 100 to whatever y currently is when it prints, I get a sequence that goes from 100 to 109. And this is useful because think about in the future, once you learn more coding, let's say you wanted something to automatically uh, label itself as this is going to be uh, this item or this product is going to be 100, this product is going to be 101. And so this is going to automatically create a sequence based off of the loop. So you can make this useful in your own programming um, or your own programs. So think about the potential. All right. So we have a simple for loop just showing how to just get it to run a set number of times. We also looked at the variable itself. We used the variable in our third example. And now I'm going to go on to controlling the range. So the for loop has the ability to also control ranges. We so far have only placed in the range five or 10, and that means it's going to run that many times. But what if you wanted your starting point to not be zero? In Python, you have the ability to set the starting point. By default, the starting point is zero, but if you don't want the starting point to be zero, you can choose another range. The only thing you really need to understand, and we'll, we'll print out the variable so that you can see it, is that the, the starting point will be the actual number that you place in there. But the ending point will always be one number less. So I'll show you an example of that. So let's write another print statement. Using a starting and end point. So for um, J in range. And so starting point, you, you put the first number as your starting point, separate it by a comma, and then you place your ending point. So let's say I wanted to start at 70 and I want it to end at 80. I'm going to print out J just to see what happens. So you can see how the, the, the numbers are working. So if you notice, we start at 70 like we wanted to before, but we end at 79. So this the ending point is not inclusive. So when, when you think about the program working, you should know that the starting point will always work, but the ending point will be one less. And it actually is the same for not having placing a starting point. It goes from zero to four, even though I put five in here. So it, it keeps the same trend, even when you have a starting point. And I'll add a note about that. Number point. or as a value. All right. Last but not least, you can also add a, um, a, a third placement. And the third placement can be an increment or a decrement. And an increment means to increase and a decrement means to decrease. So I can, in, in some ways, if you read any Python books, they'll say steps. So um, the third value that you can place in is how many steps you want to go up or jump to in between. And the other is how many steps you want to go down. If you 
put a negative number. So let's take a look at what steps do or increments or decrements or whatever you want to think of. So for I in range, I'll do the standard. I'll do starting from zero to 10. And then I'm going to place another comma and I'm going to add a step. I want it to go up meaning that it's going to have a positive value. And I want it to um, skip between, I want it to print only every other, which means to skip to two. So what two does is instead of, um, imagine that this step was actually one. And by default, it is. The steps go in order, in increases by one um, in all of the other examples. But if you wanted to increase by two, you just place a two here and I'm going to print it and say print I and then let me add a point. Using All right, so adding steps to third input. So if you notice, instead of it going from zero to 10 as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it only does every other. So starting with zero, it starts at, it prints zero. It's gonna skip to the next, um, the next pattern in the sequence, which would be two, four, six, and then eight. It's not going to print nine because um, once it hits eight, it knows to skip to, to 10, but because 10 is not inclusive, it's not going to print. So you have to think about things like that, but this will just take practice. Um, I can also go backwards. by adding a negative number. Now your range though, will have to go, um, your starting point needs to be a higher number and then your ending point needs to be a lower number and then you can add a, a negative. Um, actually, let me, let me, let's go backwards first before without the increments and then add the steps. So let me say how to go backwards. So you start off with a bigger number first, like 40, and I'm going to end at 20 and then print it out so you can see, print I. Oh, so you do need to add the steps. So I'm going to do that. It doesn't... Uh, by default, it's it's counting up, and so logically, this doesn't make sense. So I have to do a negative. So I'm gonna place a negative one, and once I place that negative one, it knows the for loop knows now instead of counting up to count backwards, it's still gonna um, the increment is the same, but it's now gonna be negative, so it's gonna count down. And this is how it works. You can also do a, a, a different number. So print. So if you notice, in order to count backwards, you have to add the, the, the last one because it didn't work if I didn't, because by default it counts up. And then I'll add, I'll do one more. Um, print. Uh, 
and we'll just call it counting backwards again. Let's do a hundred. Actually, let's do something bigger. Let's do two thousand, and I want to end at nineteen. 19 and I want to end at 1899 which will include 1900 and maybe we do this by decade so increments by 10 or decrements so so negative print and I want to print I and we have a boo boo so let's change that to So what I did was I counted backwards again, starting at the 2000s and ending um, at 1900s. And what I wanted to do was count by backwards by increments of 10 so that it, we can end up with decades. So that's the last one. Now there's one other thing you can add. And I actually recently learned this. Um, you can have a response you can add a response for um, the end of something by adding an else. So an else is going to be, in, instead of being paired with an if statement, in this case, this else is going to be paired with the for loop. So as long as, the, as long as we're looping, it's going to print I, but then we can write an else for the end, and we can print and say the loop has ended. And there it is. I will write a note about this. We can add some air. To do something once the loop is over. And that's it for for loops. It sounds simple, but you need to really practice to um, understand and, and, and figure out in your brain how this is working. Um, I could put for loops inside of for loops. Those are called nested for loops, but I'm not going to do that in this um, in this series because we're just beginners. All right, I am also going to do examples for the while loop. So I'm gonna say while loop. Examples. Now remember that while loops are going to look a little different because instead of controlling it based off of how many um, times we're going to run, and if you noticed in, in the for loops, we always used range to control the for loop for now. Um, we are going to use comparisons in a while loop to see how many times we should run or when, when it should stop. You want to be careful to make sure to avoid infinite loops. Fortunately, on Repl.it, um, this editor allows you to catch your infinite loops. Um, but in not every um, not every programming editor that you use can catch infinite loops, so it might crash your computer or crash the software that you're using. Um, I'm trying to see. All right, so let's get started. Let's do something simple like
So let's catch. Um, so one of the common mistakes that happen is when you're writing programs for clients who don't understand how the program works or for anybody who doesn't understand the, uh, how the program works, they might enter, if you're asking for input, the incorrect value or the incorrect thing that, that you need them to to write. And you want them to have another opportunity to to uh, to enter it again. And this is a, a great opportunity to use a while loop. And you can say like while they don't type in a certain input, ask them again. So we are going to, let's say, look for a keyword or a secret password. Let's make this interesting. Using a simple while loop to um, find password. So first we need input. We need to ask the user at least once before we enter the while loop. Um, and, and this is going to allow us to not, uh, end up with an infinite loop. So I'm going to create a variable, call it password, make it equal to input, enter the correct password. Run, make sure it works. That's so weird. <laughs> um, now we're going to say while the password is not equal to whatever password you want it to be. I'm going to say unicorn. While the password is not equal to unicorn, we want to first tell the user that they um, entered the like an incorrect thing um, please try again or something like that just to give them feedback to know that the, the program is working before you ask them again so I'm going to print and say incorrect try again then I'm going to copy this line of code or you can type it in again and place it inside of the while loop to, to ask them again. I'm also going to create a response to know when I'm outside of the, the while loop. And to do that, you need to make sure that your tabs, once I press enter, I'm gonna backslash or press uh, backspace or delete so that my cursor is aligned with the while loop so that I can write something here. If I write something outside of the while loop, it means that the while loop is done, kind of just like the the for loop else. Um, this is this happens once the program is done. So once the while loop is done, then I am going to print and say, "Welcome to the secret club." All right, so I'm gonna play around and be dumb and enter incorrect stuff. Now I am going to correctly write unicorn in the same way that I wrote it in my while loop and press enter and it's gonna say welcome to the secret club. And so that's how you create a while loop. You need a condition and you need um, a way for that condition to update in the in the while loop so that you don't end up with something infinite. Okay, so I asked them first, then I entered the while loop, then I asked them again so that when we loop back up, it's going to check to see if the password matches with what I'm looking for. And if it doesn't, then it continues into the loop again. So that's that's how a while loop will work. This is one way. So you can have conditions, you can put all any type of conditions, just like if statements um, into this while loop. You can add an and and an or and check for something else too. 
Um, the other way, and this is what um, programmers who spend more time in um, coding to and understand how infinite loops work, they will do something like a while true. So a while true loop is an infinite loop, but we can use a command called break to break out of the loop if a condition is met. So this is the other way to do it. Using an infinite loop then break out of it to then break out of it. We'll just keep it like that. So while true is an infinite loop, do not press run until you have some type of condition that will break out of the loop. Um, so in order to break out of the loop, you need some type of condition to happen. So, um, So in the while loop above, we wrote the condition inside of the, the, the first line of the while loop. But you can use if statements. It still meets a condition. And so you can have like an if else sequence in here and, and it'll break it based off of what you're looking for. So how about I add, in, in this case, I only have to do input once um, versus input twice in the above example. Um, Let's look for uh, a special number. Like this is a guessing game, but we're gonna set the number instead of adding any random numbers. So I'm going to look for a number equals int input, guess the number. And I'm going to say if number is equal to four, that's my the secret number, then break. I'm going to run so you can actually let me write a response outside of the while loop. Um, I'll print something that says you guessed correctly. So I'm going to correctly type in this password so that I can move on to the next program. So here goes my next program. Guess the number. I'm going to not guess four. And then eventually I am going to guess four and it says guess correctly and the program ends. You could add an else statement to respond and tell them that they got the, the number incorrect. Um, not the right number. Try again. Press run. Um, unicorn. All right, so so it gives me feedback first, and then uh, it would um, allow me to enter again. And so this second example only has one input, but I put it in an infinite loop. And the way the loop is controlled is by the if statements. If the number equals four, then it breaks out of the loop else print it's not right and it loops back up so you can do either way um, I will say that using an infinite loop is dangerous for a new programmer who doesn't understand it fully so just be careful with this one it is a more efficient way um, because you didn't have to write as much uh, maybe you had to write the same amount of code you really think about it but um, 
instead of knowing, I would say the difference is, is that this one, you needed to know exactly what the condition was. And this one, you just started the loop and then you kind of figured out what the condition would be based off of your if statements. Um, an if statement, you could add if else or elif in there. Um, and so you could look for multiple things in, the, in, in this versus this loop. You could add a break inside of this loop, but it doesn't really make sense, um, especially because you have something controlling the loop and the loop is already looking for something. In this case, um, a break is great because maybe I want to write another elif statement. And this is what I was talking about. So let's say the number was equal to um, three, because that num or the number was equal to five. And I'm going to say you're getting warmer. Um, and let's say I write three. See, it says you're getting warmer and then it will still loop because I didn't place a break in here. The break is only if I get to four. So that's, there's just two different ways to do it. And that's it. Common mistakes. <laughs> the, the most common mistake is infinite loops. You want to make sure you check your logic. And you also want to make sure that you have some way for the loop to update and check for something else. So for example, in here, I have them entering an input again before we check to see if the, if the password is equal. Down here, the input is up here, but once it goes through these if else statements, it's going to go back up and, and um, start the input again. So as long as there's a, a, an ability to update what you're looking for, then that's how you avoid infinite loops. But as a beginner programmer, to be honest, it, it's <laughs> you're not perfect. It's just going to happen. Even sometimes I end up with infinite loops. So you just want to be mindful of them. And that's it. I hope you like this video. Um, like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you on the next.